Hello, and welcome to the It's the Read You Need channel. Please like, share, and subscribe. And please leave a comment with any suggestions for future material. The Anglo-American Establishment by Carol Quigley Chapter 12 Foreign Policy, 1919-1940 Part 2 When put to a vote, the motion was defeated, 305 to 196. In the majority were Ormsby Gore, Edward Wood, Amory, three Cecils, Robert, Evelyn and Hugh, two Astors, John and Nancy, Samuel Hoare, Eustace Percy and Lord Walmer. In the minority were Fisher, Simon and Arthur Salter. By March, Fisher and Simon were more threatening to France. On the 6th of that month, Fisher said in the House of Commons, quote, I can only suggest this, that the government make it clear to France, Germany, and the whole world that they regard this present issue between France and Germany not as an issue affecting two nations, but as an issue affecting the peace and prosperity of the whole world. We should keep before ourselves steadily the idea of an international solution. We should work for it with all our power, and we should make it clear to France that any attempt to effect a separate solution of this question could not be considered otherwise than an unfriendly act. Close quote. Exactly a week later, John Simon, in a parliamentary manoeuvre, made a motion to cut the appropriation bill for the Foreign Office by £100 and seized the opportunity to make a violent attack on the actions of France. He was answered by Eustace Percy, who in turn was answered by Fisher. In this way, the group tried to keep the issue before the minds of the British public and to prepare the way for the Dawes settlement. The Rounds Table appealing to a somewhat different public, kept up a similar barrage. In the June 1923 issue, and again in September, it condemned the occupation of the Ruhr. In the former, it suggested a three-part programme as follows. 1. Find out what Germany can pay by an expert committee's investigation. 2. Leave Germany free to work and produce by an immediate evacuation of the Rhineland, and three, protect France and Germany from each other, another hint about the future of Locarno Pacts. This programme, according to the Round Table, should be imposed on France with the threat that if France did not accept it, Britain would withdraw from the Rhineland and reparations commissions and formally terminate the Entente. It concluded, quote, The Rounds Table has not hesitated in recent months to suggest that British neutrality was an attitude inconsistent either with the honour or the interests of the British Commonwealth. Close quote. The Rounds Table even went so far as to say that the inflation in Germany was caused by the burden of reparations. In the September 1923 issue, it said, probably by the pen of Brand, quote, In the last two years, it is not inflation which has brought down the mark. The printing presses have been engaged in a vain attempt to follow the depreciation of the currency. That depreciation has been a direct consequence of the world's judgment that the Allied claims for reparation were incapable of being met. It will continue until that judgment, or in other words... Those claims are revised. Close quote. In October 1923, Smuts, who was in London for the Imperial Conference and was in close contact with the group, made speeches in which he compared the French occupation of the Ruhr with the German attack on Belgium in 1914 and said that Britain, quote, 
may soon have to start rearming herself in sheer self-defence, close quote, against French militarism. John Dove, writing to Brand in a private letter, found an additional argument against France in the fact that her policy was injuring democracy in Germany. He wrote, It seems to me that the most disastrous effect of Poincaré's policy would be the final collapse of democracy in Germany, the risk of which has been pointed out in the round table. The irony of the whole situation is that if the Junkers should capture the Reich again, the same old antagonisms will revive and we shall find ourselves willy-nilly lined up again with France to avert a danger which French actions has again called into being. Even if Smuts follows up his fine speech, the situation may have changed so much before the Imperial Conference is over that people who think like him and us may find ourselves baffled. I doubt if we shall again have as good a chance of getting a peaceful democracy set up in Germany. After the Dawes plan went into force, the Milner Group's policies continued to be followed by the British government. The policy of fulfilment pursued by Germany under Stresemann was close to the heart of the group. In fact, there was a certain amount of evidence that the group was in a position to reach Stresemann and advise him to follow this policy. This was done through Smuts and Lord de Abenon. There is little doubt that the Locarno Pacts were designed in the Milner Group and were first brought into public notice by Stresemann at the suggestion of Lord de Abenon. Immediately after Smuts made his speech against France in October 1923, he got in touch with Stresemann, presumably in connection with the South African mandate in South West Africa. Smuts himself told the story to Mrs. Millen, his authorised biographer, in these words. I was in touch with them, the Germans, in London over questions concerning German South West. They had sent a man over from their foreign office to see me. I can't say the Germans have behaved very well about the German Southwest, but that is another matter. Well, naturally, my speech meant something to this fellow. The English were hating the Ruhr business. It was turning them from France to Germany. The whole English-speaking world was hating it. Curzon, in particular, was hating it. Yet, very little was being done to express all this feeling. I took it upon myself to express the feeling. I acted, you understand, unofficially. I consulted no one. But I could see my action would not be abhorrent to the government. Would, in fact, be a relief to them. When the German from the Foreign Office came to me full of this sort of attitude, would mean to stress him and I told him I was speaking only for myself. But you can see, I said, that the people here approve of my speech. If my personal advice is any use to you, I would recommend the Germans to give up their policy of non-cooperation, to rely on the goodwill of the world, and make a sincere advance towards the better understanding which I am sure can be brought about. I got in touch with Stresemann, our correspondence followed those lines. You will remember that Stresemann's policy ended in the Dawes Plan and the Pact of Locarno, and that he got the Nobel Prize for his work. In this connection, it is worthy of note that the German Chancellor at a cabinet meeting on the 12th of November 1923 quoted Smuts by name as the author of what he, Stresemann, considered the proper road out of the crisis. Lord de Abenon was not a member of the Milner Group. He was, however, a member of the Cecil Block's second generation and had been, at one time, a rather casual member of the Souls. This, it will be recalled, was the country house set in which George Curzon, Arthur Balfour, Alfred Littleton, Sir John Broderick, and the Tennant sisters were the chief figures. 
born Edgar Vincent, he was made Baron de Abenon in 1914 by Asquith, who was also a member of the Souls, and married Margot Tennant in 1894. D'Abenon joined the Coldstream Guards in 1877 after graduating from Eton, but within a few years was helping Lord Salisbury to unravel the after-effects of the Congress of Berlin. By 1880, he was private secretary to Lord Edmund Fitzmaurice, brother of Lord Lansdowne, and Commissioner for European Turkey. The following year, he was assistant to the British Commissioner for evacuation of the territory ceded to Greece by Turkey. In 1882, he was the British, Belgian and Dutch representative on the Council of the Ottoman Public Debt, and soon became president of that council. From 1883 to 1889, he was financial advisor to the Egyptian government and from 1889 to 1897 was governor of the Imperial Ottoman Bank of Constantinople. In Salisbury's third administration, he was a Conservative MP for Exeter, 1899 to 1906. The next few years were devoted to private affairs in international banking circles close to Milner. In 1920, he was the British civilian member of the Weygand mission to Warsaw. This mission undoubtedly had an important influence on his thinking. As a chief figure in Salisbury's efforts to bolster up the Ottoman Empire against Russia, de Abenon had always been anti-Russian. In this respect, his background was like Curzon's. As a result of the Warsaw mission, de Abenon's anti-Russian feeling was modified to an anti-Bolshevik one of much greater intensity. To him, the obvious solution seemed to be to build up Germany as a military bulwark against the Soviet Union. He said as much in a letter of 11th of August 1920 to Sir Maurice Hankey. This letter, printed by de Abenon in his book on the Battle of Warsaw, the 18th divisive battle of the world, published in 1931, suggests that, quote, a good bargain might be made with the German military leaders in cooperating against the Soviet. Close quote. Shortly afterwards, de Abenon was made British ambassador to Berlin. At the time, it was widely rumoured and never denied that he had been appointed primarily to obtain some settlement of the reparations problem, it being felt that his wide experience in international public finance would qualify him for this work. This may have been so but his prejudices likewise qualified him for only one solution to the problem, the one desired by the Germans. In reaching this solution, de Abenon acted as the intermediary among Strassemann, the German Chancellor, Curzon, the Foreign Secretary, and apparently Kindersley, Brand's associate at Lazard Brothers. According to Harold Nicholson in his book, Curzon, The Last Phase, 1934, quote, The initial credit for what proved the ultimate solution belongs, in all probability, to Lord de Abenon, one of the most acute and broad-minded diplomatists which this country has ever possessed, close quote. In the events leading up to Curzon's famous note to France of 11th of August 1923, the note which contended that the Ruhr occupation could not be justified under the Versailles Treaty, de Abenon played an important role both in London and in Berlin. In his Diary of an Ambassador, de Abenon merely listed the notes between Curzon and France and added, quote, Throughout this controversy, Lord de Abenon had been consulted. Close quote. During his term as ambassador in Berlin, de Abenon's policy was identical with that of the Milner Group, except for the shading that he was more anti Soviet and less anti French, and was more impetuous in his desire to tear up the Treaty of Versailles in favour of Germany. This last distinction rested on the fact that de Abenon was ready to appease Germany regardless of whether it were democratic or not. Indeed, he did not regard democracy as either necessary or good for Germany. 
the Milner Group, until 1929, were still in favour of a democratic Germany, because they realised better than de Abenen the danger to civilization from an undemocratic Germany. It took the World Depression and its resulting social unrest to bring the Milner Group around to the view which de Abenen held as early as 1920, that appeasement to an undemocratic Germany could be used as a weapon against social disorder. Brigadier General J. H. Morgan, whom we have already quoted, makes perfectly clear that Abenen was one of the chief obstacles in the path of the Inter-Allied Commission's efforts to force Germany to disarm. In 1920, when von Siecht, commander of the German army, sought modifications of the disarmament's rules, which would have permitted large-scale evasion of their provisions, General Morgan found it impossible to get his dissenting reports accepted in London. He wrote in Assize of Arms, quote, At the eleventh hour I managed to get my reports on the implications of von Siecht's plan, brought to the direct notice of Mr. Lloyd George through the agency of my friend Philip Kerr, who, after reading these reports, advised the Prime Minister to reject von Siecht's proposals. Rejected they were at the Conference of Spa in July 1920, as we shall see, but von Siecht refused to accept defeat and fell back on a second move. Close quote. When, in 1921, General Morgan became gravely disturbed at the evasions of German disarmament, he wrote a memorandum on the subject. It was suppressed by Lord de Abenon. Morgan added in his book, quote, I was not altogether surprised. Lord de Abenon was the apostle of appeasement. Close quote. In January 1923, this apostle of appeasement forced the British delegation on the Disarmament Commission to stop all inspection operations in Germany. They were never resumed, although the Commission remained in Germany for four more years, and the French could do nothing without the British members. Throughout 1923 and 1924, de Abenon put pressure on both the German and the British governments to pursue a policy on the reparations question which was identical with that which Smuts was advocating at the same time and in the same quarters. He put pressure on the British government to follow this policy on the grounds that any different policy would lead to Strassemann's fall from office. This would result in a very dangerous situation, according to de Abenon and Strassemann, where Germany might fall into the control of either the extreme left or the extreme right. For example, a minute of a German cabinet meeting of 2nd of November 1923, found by Eric Sutton among Stressemann's papers and published by him, said in part, quote, To the English ambassador, who made some rather anxious inquiries, Stressemann stated that the maintenance of the state of siege was absolutely essential in view of the risk of a putsch, both from the left and from the right. He would use all his efforts to preserve the unity of the Reich. Lord de Abenon replied that his view, which was shared in influential quarters in London, was that Stressemann was the only man who could steer the German ship of state through the present troubled waters. Close quote. Among the quarters in London which shared this view, we find the Milner Group. The settlement which emerged from the crisis, the Dawes Plan and the evacuation of the Ruhr, was exactly what the Milner Group wanted. From that point on, to the banking crisis of 1931, their satisfaction continued. In the years 1929-31, to 31, they clearly had no direct influence on affairs, chiefly because a Labour government was in office in London, but their earlier activities had so predetermined the situation that it continued to develop in the direction they wished. After the banking crisis of 1931, the whole structure of international finance, with which the group had been so closely associated, disappeared and, after a brief period of doubt, was replaced by a rapid growth of monopolistic national capitalism. 
This was accepted by the Milner Group with hardly a break in stride. Hitchens had been deeply involved in monopolistic heavy industry for a quarter of a century in 1932. Milner had advocated a system of national capitalism with industrial self-regulation behind tariff walls even earlier. Amory and others had accepted much of this as a method, although they did not necessarily embrace Milner's rather socialistic goals. As a result, in the period of 1931-33, to the Milner Group willingly liquidated reparations, war debts, and the whole structure of international capitalism, and embraced protectionism and cartels instead. Parallel with their destruction of reparations, and in a much more direct fashion, the Milner Group destroyed collective security through the League of Nations. The group never intended that the League of Nations should be used to achieve collective security. They never intended that sanctions, either military or economic, should be used to force any aggressive power to keep the peace or to enforce any political decision which might be reached by international agreement. This must be understood at the beginning. The Milner Group never intended that the League should be used as an instrument of collective security or that sanctions should be used as an instrument by the League. From the beginning, they expected only two things from the League. One, that it could be used as a centre for international cooperation in international administration in non-political matters. And two, that it could be used as a centre for consultation in political matters. In regard to the first point, the group regarded the League as a centre for such activities as those previously exercised through the International Postal Union. In all such activities as this, each state would retain full sovereignty and would cooperate only on a completely voluntary basis in fields of social importance. In regard to the second point, political questions, no member of the group had any intention of any state yielding any silver of its full sovereignty to the League. The League was merely an agreement, like any treaty was, by which each state bound itself to confer together in a crisis and not make war within three months of the submission of the question to consultation. The whole purpose of the League was to delay action in a crisis by requiring this period for consultation. There was no restriction on action after the three months. There was some doubt within the group as to whether sanctions could be used to compel a state to observe the three months delay. Most of the members of the group said no to this question. A few said that economic sanctions could be used. Robert Cecil, at the beginning at least, felt that political sanctions might be used to compel a state to keep the peace for the three months, but by 1922, every member of the group had abandoned both political and economic sanctions for enforcing the three months' delay. There never was within the group any intention at any time to use sanctions for any other purpose, such as keeping peace after the three-month period. This, then, was the point of view of the Milner Group in 1919, as in 1939. Unfortunately, in the process of drawing up the Covenant of the League in 1919, certain phrases or impl implications were introduced into the document, under pressure from France, from Woodrow Wilson, and from other groups in Britain, which could be taken to indicate that the League might have been intended to be used as a real instrument of collective security, that it might have involved some minute limitation of state sovereignty, that sanctions might under certain circumstances be used to protect the peace. As soon as these implications became clear, the group's ardour for the League began to evaporate. When the United States refused to join the League, this dwindling ardour turned to hatred. Nevertheless, the group did not abandon the League at this point. On the contrary, they tightened their grip on it. In order to prevent any foolish persons from using the vague implications of the Covenant in an effort to make the League an instrument of collective security. 
The group were determined that if any such effort as this were made, they would prevent it and, if necessary, destroy the League to prevent it. Only they would insist, in such a case, that the League was destroyed not by them, but by the persons who tried to use it as an instrument of collective security. All of this may sound extreme. Unfortunately, it is not extreme. That this is what the group did to the League is established beyond doubt in history. That the group intended to do this is equally beyond dispute. The evidence is conclusive. The British ideas on the League and the British drafts of the Covenant were formed by four men, all close to the Milner Group. They were Lord Robert Cecil, General Smuts, Lord Fillimore and Alfred Zimmern. For drafting documents, they frequently used Cecil Hurst, a close associate, but not a member of the group. Hurst, Sir Cecil since 1920, was assistant legal advisor to the Foreign Office in 1902-18, to legal advisor in 1918-29, to a judge on the Permanent Court of International Justice at The Hague in 1929-46, to and Chairman of the United Nations War Crimes Commission in 1943-44. to He was the man responsible for the verbal form of Articles 10-16, the sanction articles, of the Covenant of the League of Nations, for the Articles of Agreement with Ireland in 1921, and for the wording of the Locarno Pact in 1925. He frequently worked closely with the Milner Group. For example, in 1921, he was instrumental in making an agreement by which the British Yearbook of International Law, of which he was editor, was affiliated with the Royal Institute of International Affairs. At this time, he and Curtis were working together on the Irish Agreement. As early as 1916, Lord Robert Cecil was trying to persuade the Cabinet to support the League of Nations. This resulted in the appointment of the Fillimore Committee, which drew up the first British draft of the Covenant. As a result, in 1918-19, Lord Robert became the chief government spokesman for the League of Nations, and the presumed author of the second British draft. The real author of this second draft was Alfred Zimmern. Cecil and Zimmern were both dubious of any organisation that would restrict state sovereignty. On the 12th of November 1918, the day after the armistice, Lord Robert made a speech at Birmingham on the type of league he expected, that speech shows clearly that he had little faith in the possibility of disarmament and none in international justice or military sanctions to preserve the peace. The sovereignty of each state was left intact. As W. E. Rappard, director of the Graduate School of International Studies at Geneva, wrote in International Conciliation in June 1927, quote, he, Lord Cecil, was very sceptical about the possibility of submitting vital international questions to the judgment of courts of law, and confessed to the gravest doubts as to the practicability of enforcing the decrees of such courts by any form of international force. On the other hand, he firmly believed in the efficacy of economic pressure as a means of coercing a country bent on aggression in violation of its Pacific Agreements, close quote. It might be remarked in passing that the belief that economic sanctions could be used without a backing of military force, or the possibility of needing such a backing, is the one sure sign of a novice in foreign politics, and Robert Cecil could never be called a novice in such matters. In the speech itself, he said... The most important step we can now take is to devise machinery which, in case of international dispute, will, at the least, delay the outbreak of war and secure full and open discussion of the causes of the quarrel. For that purpose, all that would be necessary would be a treaty binding the signatories never to wage war themselves or permit others to wage war till a formal conference of nations 
had been held to inquire into and, if possible, decide the dispute. It is probably true, at least in theory, that decisions would be difficult to obtain, for the decisions of such a conference, like all other international proceedings, would have to be unanimous to be binding. But since the important thing is to secure delay and open discussion, that is to say, time to enable public opinion to act and information to instruct it, this is not a serious objection to the proposal. Indeed, from one point of view, it is an advantage, since it avoids any interference with national sovereignty except the interposition of a delay in seeking redress by the force of arms. This is the essential thing. To that extent, and to that extent only, international coercion would be necessary. This speech of Cecil's was approved by the Round Table and accepted as its own point of view in the issue of December 1918. At the same time, through Smuts, the Milner Group published another statement of its views. This pamphlet, called The League of Nations, A Practical Suggestion, was released in December 1918, after having been read in manuscript and criticised by the Inner Circle, especially Curtis. This statement devoted most of its efforts to the use of mandates for captured German colonies. For preserving the peace, it had considerable faith in compulsory arbitration and hoped to combine this with widespread disarmament. The group's own statement on this subject appeared in the December 1918 issue of the Round Table in an article called Windows of Freedom, written by Curtis. He pointed out that British sea power had twice saved civilization, and any proposal that it should be used in the future only at the request of the League of Nations must be emphatically rejected. The League would consist of fallible human beings, and England could never yield her decision to them. He continued, quote, Her own existence and that of the world's freedom are inseparably connected. To yield it without a blow is to yield the whole citadel in which the forces that make for human freedom are entrenched. To covenant to yield is to bargain a betrayal of the world in advance. The League must not be a world government. If the burden of a world government is placed on it, it will fall and crash. Close quote. He pointed out that it could be a world government only if it represented peoples and not states, and if it had the power to tax those peoples. It should simply be an interstate conference of the world. The peace conference cannot hope to produce a written constitution for the globe or a genuine government of mankind. What it can do is establish a permanent annual conference between foreign ministers themselves with a permanent secretariat in which as at the peace conference itself, all questions at issue between states can be discussed and, if possible, settled by agreement. Such a conference cannot itself govern the world, still less those portions of mankind who cannot yet govern themselves. But it can act as a symbol and organ of the human conscience, however imperfect, to which real governments of existing states can be made answerable for facts which concern the world at large. In another article in the same issue of the Round Table, Some Principles and Problems of the Settlement, December 1918, similar ideas were expressed even more explicitly by Zimmern. He stated that the League of Nations should be called the League of States, or the Interstate Conference, for sovereign states would be its units, and it would make not laws but contracts. Quote, the League of Nations, in fact, so far from invalidating or diminishing national sovereignty, should strengthen and increase it. The work before the coming age is not to supersede the existing states, but to moralise them. 
membership must be restricted to those states where authority is based upon the consent of the people over whom it is exercised. The reign of law. It can reasonably demanded that no states should be admitted which do not make such a consummation one of the deliberate aims of their policy. Close quote. Under this idea, the rounds table excluded by name from the New League, Liberia, Mexico, and above all, Russia. The League, it continued, will not simply be a League of States, it will be a League of Commonwealths. As its hopes in the League dwindled, the round table became less exclusive, and in June 1919 it declared, Without Germany or Russia, the League of Nations will be dangerously incomplete. In the March 1919 issue, the Rounds Table described in detail the kind of league it wanted. A common clearinghouse for non-contentious business. Its whole basis was to be public opinion, and its organisation was to be that of an assembly point of bureaucrats of various countries, about an international secretariat and various organisations like the International Postal Union, or the International Institute of Agriculture. Every great department of government in each country whose activities touch those of similar departments in other countries should have its recognised delegates on a permanent international commission, charged with the study of the sphere of international relations in question, and with the duty of making recommendations to their various governments. Across the street as it were, from those permanent bureaus, at the capital of the League, there should be another central permanent bureau, an international secretariat. They must not be national ambassadors, but civil servants under the sole direction of a non-national chancellor. And the aim of the whole organisation must be to evolve a practical international sense a sense of common service. This plan regarded the Council of the League as the successor of the Supreme War Council, made up of premiers and foreign ministers, and the instrument for dealing with political questions in a purely consultative way. Accordingly, the Council would consist only of the great powers. These plans for the Covenant of the League of Nations were rudely shattered at the peace conference when the French demanded that the new organisation be a super-state, with its own army and powers of action. The British were horrified, but with the help of the Americans were able to shelve this suggestion. However, to satisfy the demand from their own delegations as well as the French, they spread a camouflage of sham world government over the structure they had planned. This was done by Cecil Hurst. Hurst visited David Hunter Miller, the American legal expert, one night and persuaded him to replace the vital clauses 10 to 16 with drafts drawn up by Hurst. These drafts were deliberately drawn with loopholes so that no aggressor need ever be driven to the point where sanctions would have to be applied. This was done by presenting alternative paths of action leading towards sanctions, some of them leading to economic sanctions, but one path, which could be freely chosen by the aggressor, was always available, leading to a loophole where no collective action would be possible. The whole procedure was concealed beneath a veil of legalistic terminology, so that the covenant could be presented to the public as a watertight document. But Britain could always escape from the necessity to apply sanctions through a loophole. In spite of this, the Milner Group were very dissatisfied. They tried simultaneously to do three things. 1. To persuade public opinion that the League was a wonderful instrument of international cooperation designed to keep the peace. 2. To criticise the Covenant for the traces of a sham world government which had been thrown over it, and three, to reassure themselves and the ruling groups in England, the Dominions and the United States, 
that the League was not a world state. All of this took a great deal of neat footwork, or, more accurately, nimble tongues and neat penwork. More double-talk and double-writing were omitted by the Milner Group on this subject in the two decades 1919-39 to than was issued by any other group on this subject in the period. Among themselves, the group did not conceal their judgment with the Covenant because it went too far. In the June 1919 issue of the Round Table, they said reassuringly, quote, The document is not the constitution of a superstate, but, as its title explains, a solemn agreement between sovereign states which consent to limit their complete freedom of action on certain points. The League must continue to depend on the free consent, in the last resort, of its component states. This assumption is evident in nearly every article of the Covenant, of which the ultimate and most effective sanction must be the public opinion of the civilised world. If the nations of the future are in the main selfish, grasping and bellicose, no instrument or machinery will restrain them. Close quote. But in the same issue, we read the complaint, quote, in the Imperial Conference, Sir Wilfrid Laurier was never tired of saying, This is not a government, but a conference of governments with governments. It is a pity that there was no one in Paris to keep on saying this. For the covenant is still marked by the traces of sham government. Close quote. By the March 1920 issue, the full bitterness of the group on this last point became evident. It said, quote, The League has failed to secure the adhesion of one of its most important members, the United States, and is very unlikely to secure it. The situation presents a very serious problem for the British Empire. We have not only undertaken great obligations under the League, which we must now both in honesty and in self-regard revise, but we have looked to the League to provide us with the machinery for united British action in foreign affairs. The article continued with criticism of Wilson and praise of the Republican Senate's refusal to swallow the League as it stood. It then said, The vital weakness of the treaty and the covenant became more clear than ever in the months succeeding the signature at Versailles. A settlement based on ideal principles and poetic justice can be permanently applied and maintained only by a world government to which all nations will subordinate their private interests. It demands not only that they should sacrifice their private interests to this world interest, but also that they should be prepared to enforce the claims of world interest even in matters where their own interests are in no wise engaged it demands, in fact, that they should subordinate their national sovereignty to an international code and an international ideal. The reservations of the American Senate point the practical difficulties of this ideal with simple force. All the reservations are affirmations of the sovereign right of the American people to make their own policy without interference from an international league. None of these reservations, it should be noted, contravenes the general aims of the League, but they are, one and all, directed to ensure that no action is taken in pursuit of those aims except with the consent and approval of the Congress. There is nothing peculiar in this attitude. It is merely, we repeat, the broad reflex of an attitude already taken up by all the European allies in question where their national interests are affected, and also by the British dominions in their relations with the British government. It gives us a statement in plain English, of all limitations to the ideal of international action which none of the other allies will, in practice, dispute. So far, therefore, from destroying the League of Nations, the American reservations have rendered it the great service of pointing clearly to the flaws which at present neutralise its worth. Among these flaws, in the opinion of the Milner Group, 
was the fact that their plan to use the League of Nations as a method of tying the Dominions more closely to the United Kingdom had failed, and, instead, the Covenant gave the Dominions the grounds, or rather the excuse, to avoid closer union with the United Kingdom. It had been found in Paris that in order to preserve its unity, the British delegation must meet frequently as a delegation to discuss its policy before meeting the representatives of foreign nations in conference. How was this unity of action to be maintained after the signature of peace without committing the Dominion governments to some new constitutional organisation within the Commonwealth? And if some new constitutional organisation were to be devised for this purpose, how could it fail to limit in some way the full national independent status which the Dominion governments had just achieved by their recognition as individual members of the League of Nations? The answer to these questions was found in cooperation within the League, which was to serve not only as the link between the British Empire and the foreign powers, but as the link also between the constituent nations of the British Empire itself. Imbued with this idea, the Dominion statesmen accepted obligations to foreign powers under the Covenant of the League, more binding than any obligations which they would undertake to their kindred nations within the British Empire. In other words, they mortgaged their freedom of action to a league of foreign states in order to avoid the possibility of mortgaging it to the British government. It hardly required the reservations of the American Senate to demonstrate the illusory character of this arrangement. The British Dominions have made no such reservations with regard to the Covenant, and they are therefore bound by the obligations which have been rejected by the United States. Canada, Australia, South Africa and New Zealand are, in fact, bound by stronger written obligations to Poland and Czechoslovakia than to the British Isles. It is almost needless to observe that none of the democracies of the British Empire has grasped the extent of its obligations to the League of Nations, or would hesitate to repudiate them at once, if put to the test. If England were threatened by invasion, the other British democracies would mobilise at once for her support. But, though they have a written obligation to Poland, which they have never dreamed of giving to England, they would not, in practice, mobilise a single man to defend the integrity of the Corridor of Danzig or any other Polish territorial interest. This is a dangerous and equivocal situation. It is time that our democracies review and corrected it with the clearness of vision and candour of statement displayed by the much-abused Senate of the United States. To what course of action do these conclusions point? They point in the first place to revision of our obligations under the League. We are at present pledged to guarantees of territorial arrangements in Europe, which may be challenged at any time by forces too powerful for diplomatic control, and it is becoming evident that in no part of the Empire would public opinion sanction our active interference in the local disputes which may ensue. The Polish corridor to Danzig is a case in point. Our proper course is to revise and restate our position towards the League in accordance with these facts. First, we wish to do our utmost to guarantee peace, liberty and law throughout the world without committing ourselves to quixotic obligations to foreign states. Second, we wish to assist and develop the simple mechanism of international dealing embodied in the League without mortgaging our freedom of action and judgment under an international covenant. Our policy towards the League should, therefore, be revised on the following guiding lines. 1. We should state definitely that our action within the League will be governed solely by our own judgment of every situation as it arises, and we must undertake no general obligations which may not be able or willing, when the test comes, to discharge. 2. We must in no case commit ourselves to responsibilities which we cannot discharge to the full with our own resources, 
independent of assistance from any foreign power. 3. We must definitely renounce the idea that the League may normally enforce its opinions by military or economic pressure on the recalcitrant states. It exists to bring principles together for open discussion of international difficulties, to extend and develop the mechanisms and habit of international cooperation, and to establish an atmosphere in which international controversies can be settled with fairness and goodwill. With the less ambitious objects defined above, it will sooner or later secure the wholehearted support of American opinion. The influence of the League of Nations upon British imperial relations has, for the moment, been misleading and dangerous. It is only a question of time before this situation leads to an incident of some kind which will provoke the bitterest recrimination and controversy. In the leading article of the September 1920 issue, the round table took up the same problem and repeated many of its arguments. It blamed Wilson for corrupting the Covenant into a pseudo-world government by adding sham decorations to a fundamentally different structure based on consultation of sovereign states. Instead of the Covenant, it concluded, we should have merely continued the Supreme Council, which was working so well at Spa. In spite of this complete disillusionment with the League, the Milner Group still continued to keep a firm grip on as much of it as Britain could control. In the first hundred sessions of the Council of the League of Nations, 1920-38, 30 different persons sat as delegates for Britain. Omitting the four who sat for Labour governments, we have 26. Of these, seven were from the Milner Group. Seven others were present at only one session and are of little significance. The others were almost all from the Cecil block, close to the Milner group. The following list indicates the distribution. What follows is the name, followed by the number of sessions as delegate. Anthony Eden, 39. Sir John Simon, 22. Sir Austin Chamberlain, 20. Arthur Balfour, 16. Sir Robert Cecil, 15. Sir Alexander Cadogan, 12. E. H. Carr, 8. H. A. L. Fisher, 7. Sir William Malkin, 7. Viscount Cranbourne, 5. Lord Curzon, 3. Lord Londonderry, 3. Leopold Amory, 2. Edward Wood, Lord Halifax, 2. Cecil Hurst, 2. Sir Edward H. Young, 2. Lord Cushenden, 2. Lord Onslow, 2. Gilbert Murray, 1. Sir Rennell Rod, 1. And six others with one each. At the annual meetings of the Assembly of the League, a somewhat similar situation existed. The delegations had from three to eight members, with about half of the number being from the Milner Group, except when members of the Labour Party were present. H. A. L. Fisher was a delegate in 1920, 21 and 22. Mrs. Alfred Littleton was one in 1923, 26, 27, 28 and 31. Lord Astor was one in 1931, 1936 and 38. Cecil Hurst was one in 1924, 26 and 27 and 1928. Gilbert Murray was one in 1924. Lord Halifax was one in 1923 and 1936. Ormsby Gore was one in 1933. Lord Robert Cecil was one in 1923, 26 29, 30, 31, and 32. E. H. Carr was one in 1933 and 1934, etc. The Milner Group control was almost complete at the crucial 12th Assembly in 1931, 
when the delegation of five members consisted of Lord Robert Cecil, Lord Lytton, Lord Astor, Arthur Salter, and Mrs. Littleton. In addition, the group frequently had other members attached to the delegations as secretaries or substitutes. Among these were E.H. Carr, A.L. Smith, and R.M. Makins. Moreover, the group frequently had members on the delegations from the Dominions. The South African delegation of 1920 had Robert Cecil. In 1921, it had Robert Cecil and Gilbert Murray. In 1923, it had Smuts and Gilbert Murray. The Australian delegation had Sir John Latham in 1926, while the Canadian delegation had Vincent Massey ten years later. The Indian delegation had L. F. Rushbrook Williams in 1925. The Milner Group was also influential in the Secretariat of the League. Sir Eric Drummond, now 16th Earl of Perth, who had been Balfour's private secretary from 1916 to 1919, was Secretary General to the League from 1919 to 1933, when he resigned to become British Ambassador in Rome. Not a member of the group, he was nevertheless close to it. Harold Butler, of the group and of All Souls, was Deputy Director and Director of the International Labour Office in the period 1920-38. to Arthur Salter, of the group and All Souls, was Director of the Economic and Financial Section of the League in 1919-20, to and again in 1922-31. to B. H. Sumner, of the group and All Souls, now Warden, was on the staff of the ILO in 1920-22. to R. M. Makins, of the group and All Souls, was Assistant Advisor and Advisor on League of Nations Affairs at the Foreign Office in 1937-1939. to to build up public opinion in favour of the League of Nations, the Milner Group formed an organisation known as the League of Nations Union. In this organisation, the most active figures were Lord Robert Cecil, Gilbert Murray, the present Lord Escher, Mrs Littleton and Wilson Harris. Lord Cecil was president from 1923 to 1945, Professor Murray was chairman from 1923 to 1938 and co-president from 1938 to 1945. Wilson Harris was its parliamentary secretary and editor of its paper, Headway, for many years. Among others, C.A. McCartney of All Souls and the Royal Institute of International Affairs was head of the intelligence department from 1928 to 36. Harris and McCartney were late additions to the group, the former becoming a member of the Inner Circle about 1922, while the latter became a member of the Outer Circle in the late 1920s, probably as a result of his association with the Encyclopaedia Britannica as an expert on Central Europe. Wilson Harris was one of the most intimate associates of Lionel Curtis, Philip Kerr, and other members of the inner corps in the 1920s, and this association became closer, if possible, in the 1930s. A graduate of Cambridge University in 1906, he served for many years in various capacities with the Daily News. Since 1932, he has been editor of The Spectator, and since 1945, he has been a member of Parliament for Cambridge University. He was one of the most ardent advocates of appeasement in the period 1935-39, to especially in the meetings at Chatham House. In this connection, it might be mentioned that he was a member of the Council of the Royal Institute of International Affairs in 1924-27. to He has written books on Woodrow Wilson, the Peace Settlement, the League of Nations, Disarmament, etc., his most recent work is a biography of J. A. Spender, one-time editor of the Westminster Gazette, 1896-1922, to which he and his brother founded in 1893 in collaboration with Edmund Garrett and Edward Cook, 
when all four left the Pall Mall Gazette after its purchase by Waldorf Astor. The ability of the Milner Group to mobilise public opinion in regard to the League of Nations is almost beyond belief. It was not a simple task, since they were simultaneously trying to do two things. On the one hand, seeking to build up popular opinion in favour of the League, so that its work could be done more effectively, and, at the same time, seeking to prevent influential people from using the League as an instrument of world government before popular opinion was ready for a world government. In general, the Round Table and the Times were used for the latter purpose, while the League of Nations Union and a strange assortment of outlets such as Chatham House, Toynbee Hall, extension courses at Oxford, adult education courses in London, international conciliation in the United States, the Institute of Politics at Williamstown, the Institute of Intellectual Cooperation in Paris, the Geneva School of International Studies, and the Graduate Institute of International Studies at Geneva, and the various branches of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, were used for the former purpose. The Milner Group did not control all of these. Their influence was strong in all of them, and, since the influence of J.P. Morgan and Company was also strong in most of them, and since Morgan and the Group were pursuing a parallel policy on this issue, the Group were usually able to utilise the resources of these various organisations when they wished.